These days the GM LS engine has become the go-to swap for just about any hot rod or factory car conversion that you could think of. Now when it comes to the LS engine it's well known there's a lot of add-on accessories to make more power either naturally aspirated or with forced induction but if 8 cylinders is good surely 12 is going to be better. We're here with Matt from V12 LS to find out what goes into building a bespoke V12 engine based on the LS architecture. So Matt, a lot of people might be thinking that building a V12 is going to be pretty pretty much a walk in the park. You've already got everything there but of course you've got a, a block that's uh, four cylinders long, yep. cylinder head that's four cylinders long so it sounds like this should be a fair bit to uh, redesigning this engine into a V12. Where do you even get started? Yeah, obviously it's a different block heads, crank and cam. Um, and what you said about everything being LS swapped these days, that's really why we did this. We came to SEMA five years ago and it was right at the height of the LS swap with the factory plastic cover on the top. And we saw these engines out there in these cars where literally every component, every piece of suspension, every panel, everything was a custom piece of engineering. And as an engineering company and rapid prototyping company, we said, well, this is not good enough. Why are there three, four, five hundred thousand dollar cars and now actually even up to million dollar cars with parts counter engines in them so it is difficult to stand out from the crowd if you're running a generic LS swap I'll definitely uh, admit to that absolutely and now there are a lot of really cool intakes and a lot of people doing cool things with it. so it's really good to see see what people are doing with them but we thought you know what why not bring that level of engineering so so we we thought the LS was the hottest engine in the aftermarket at the time and still is I suppose um, so we went about uh, first prototyping with cutting and welding just to see if it would run now of course it's not production uh, something you do for production so uh, a cut and shut of two blocks we did just to see if it would work and it did make one and a half times the horsepower of the same engine uh, the same engine would in the V8 form oh, hold up hold up hold up so you're actually talking you got this to a point where it was running so this wasn't yeah, just yeah. A, a mock up it was an actual uh, running uh, engine absolutely well I'd not like to dwell on this because it seems yeah, it's, it's not really what we do but um, it was it was pretty cool to see we made 700 plus horsepower using used Commodore components uh, from two junkyard Commodores in Australia so once we got to that point we said you know like I said our company's industrial design and rapid prototyping company so we started making molds and, and patterns um, to uh, to create the V12 LS so block heads crank and cam are the unique parts after that go to our good partners here, you know, K1 rods in all of these, um, Weissco pistons in this one, particularly we normally use a JE as our, our base model piston. Um, and yeah, we just uh, assemble them like a normal LS. Very little difference, uh, you've got to machine flat the, um, the timing wheel because obviously you've got a neutral balanced engine versus an imbalanced engine. So other than just, a few Just, just stop, stop yeah. there and just, uh, there's a few things I want to dig into, but sure. just what you said there about a, a neutral balance yeah. engine, can you explain and, and sort of plain English what that actually means and why that's important to understand. Yeah of course I mean I suppose for anyone who hasn't gone through the full HP Academy course to understand primary and secondary imbalance so primary balance um, on, of, a, of a V12 um, it's got a triplane crank um, so and, and you've got with three pistons um, you've got We've got a piston at each end going up and down. So when you pull the head off a straight six, you can see the, the pistons going up and down together. The next one's just firing pairs going up and down together. The next one's going up and down. And obviously, I don't fire at the same time in a four cycle. So that's pretty simple. Now, your secondary imbalance, as of course, per on the bank, things are slowing down and speeding up because they're off on, a, on an angle versus the circle, just like a water skier, if, if you will. Now, that secondary imbalance, if you've got two other pistons in it with a triplane crank speeding up or slowing down exactly, compensating for those you get a perfect secondary imbalance and then of course because you've got the rock you know rocking imbalance with those ends ends uh, ends end to end balance that you see in a cross plane crank now you could probably explain that better than I can Andre no, I think you've done a pretty good job there oh, Matt that, that pretty much explains things I think to a, to a point we can understand it now when you're getting started with essentially a blank sheet of paper other than the fact you want to keep the, the LS block architecture, yeah. the LS cylinder head architecture and obviously the ability to run all of those existing uh, engine components, yep. uh, can you talk to us about the process of designing that block from a V8 to a V12? Do you literally just copy and paste add some more cylinders onto the end? Uh, well, you could start with that and then obviously just like all, you know, blocks made by Dart aftermarket, you're going to make some improvements. So we've seen, we looked at where the failure points were on the LS. Um, so we've got webbing between the banks here. Um, uh, so bank to bank webbing, as you know, that often that's where they'll split apart. We've also gone with a Siamese bore, which helps stiffen up the bore, uh, which is another failure point on the LS platform. We've also uh, reduced the bank to bank um, 
uh, ventilation, but we still do have some. So we know there's been some Ellis's with none and some with more, and and uh, and it's you know it's really proven to be the best blocks have a little bit of bank to bank ventilation, but still keep the most strength possible around the uh, around the crank journals down there. So they're probably our three largest, um, you know. Enhanced differences. Yeah. Now, obviously, the the LS and stock form. You're, you're talking LS one onwards alloy block yep. and, and nice and light, but yep. they're also going to become a limitation in terms of strength, particularly guys who are pushing really big power with uh, forced induction. That, that that's yep. an issue. Obviously, then there's the LSX block and yes. there's the 5.3 cast iron block. So, can you tell us you've got two options here? Can you talk us through that? Yeah, we do. So we do an alloy block for anywhere where weight is a major consideration, and we do have some customers who weight is a big concern. We're only talking about you know. Um, you know, 100, 150 kilo difference. It's not a huge difference because the whole engine, the rest of the engine is still assembled with the same. It's the same crankshaft, same pistons, same rods. So, um, you know, while the weight, weight difference isn't huge, some people really want that lighter weight. For anyone like this engine here that's going to be boosted, we do encourage people to go with the iron block just because it's super, super strong. So you think of this as an iron block with enhancements on top of it. Um, we've also got the LS7, um, or sorry, LSX style pinch bolts. Um, so these are some additional bolts around the outside of the cylinder head to the block? They are, and they're not talked up as strong as your normal um, yeah, head bolts, um, but they do help um, prevent, um, prevent lift uh, under boost. Uh, and we've got a Cometic head gasket made to suit that as well. So we've tooled up with Cometic so you can get those good quality MLS head gaskets. Um, and we do have a few with copper. I mean, we, we can do copper, as you know, in race applications, it's great. I've never, personally, I've run copper gaskets on many things without trouble, but we do know MLS is super, super reliable for something you've got to offer a warranty on, and copper Copper is your other alternative for racing. All right. So with the uh, with the block options there, you've got your cast iron, you've got the the alloy. Uh, in terms of the the block, is it uh, uh, sort of reading it between the lines there? Essentially, you've copied in some of those LSX enhancements like the pinch bolts, and, and sort of given the best of both worlds there. Yeah, we try to um, make it uh, like, like hot riding. You bring all the good parts together and all the best of everything that you can, uh, and then you know obviously we test, uh, and that's that's what we did. We uh, yeah. So there's some other complexities as well. The cast iron block in a lot of ways actually makes things easier, particularly no need to sleeve. So uh, some complexities around that, adding sleeves, as well as you talked about sleeving the lifter bores as well? Yeah. In the, we, in the alloy block, I should say. Yeah. Oh yeah, all in the alloy. Um, but yeah, we do sleeve our lifter bores. Um, you know, some people say you don't need to. I just think it's a good practice and good safe thing to do. Just the same, just same as running studs is a great practice um, for many reasons. Um, yeah, obviously, obviously uh, you know, even talking and, and getting more bite on, you know, a more part, more area on the block. Um, so, you yeah, know, we just try to do things that we've seen as best practice in racing engines. So, you know, our base model engines are 750 horsepower engines, nothing that wild, but we actually have things in there that, um, you know, when we work with BNR engines building these, that they've put in engines at 2000 plus spec. So think of, you know, there's nothing wrong with a little bit of overkill or a little bit of best practice, doing everything the best way that's proven. And the other thing is when people start pushing these, Haltech have got four turbos from Garrett going on to one and, and obviously Josh Robertson with two Magnussons. So people are going to start pushing them. So we're going to get to see what these do finally. I mean, they keep going into these SEMA show cars, which is so much fun and so cool. And the torque curve on these when I've driven them, they're still amazing to drive and will blow most factory street cars, you know, out of the water. But compared to as car guys and, and racers, we, we, you know, we're used to that, that big numbers. And you really want to obviously see what the engine is capable of when pushed to the limit. Absolutely. So um, that's one of the reasons we're doing this with Josh. So this is sort of a collaboration that we've got to really push it. Um, and, you know, we, we'd pull down our, um, our standard engines or our naturally aspirated engines after a lot of miles and checked them out and everything's good. Well, that's exactly what we're trying to do here. So this is the first big boosted one where he's going to do probably, you know, 100, 100, uh, 100 runs on a, a drift track and, you know, over a season just of exhibitions. It's going to be an exhibition car um, primarily. Can't, can't compete in Formula Drift because of the, the modifications that we've got and, and also, you know, a few other reasons. So it's really for exhibitions. So he's going to beat the hell out of it and then we can pull it down and, and, uh, and learn. All right. And getting back to the rest of the bespoke parts here, uh, you've talked about the block obviously, you've also got the cylinder head casting. Now when you're starting from a clean sheet of paper there with the cylinder head obviously you've got a lot of flexibility yep. in, in what you can do. You wanted to stay uh, compatible with the other LS aftermarket yeah. components, so where have you compromised that? What, 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 do you, what have you actually sort of done with the, the head design? 
Yeah, so we went straight to doing the LSX style head. I mean, if you're going to try to get something that's compatible with GM components, which was always our goal um, for these engines, and also for familiarity, people working with these, um, there's so much research has already been done. So, so you're crazy to reinvent the wheel in many places. So, you know, link bar lifters. We use comp link bar lifters. They're a nice short travel hydraulic. They, they work. Um, so yeah, we've been testing those out and they've been working really well. We haven't gone and had to go and invent a lifter just, just for our engine. That's a really good example. Um, rockers, we can use different you know, rockers that will work with the LS7 style head. Obviously you've got the different offset. Um, you could say that is a bit of a compromise. Uh, one thing we did do was we just went with a tried and proven standard style valve. We didn't go sort of fancy on the valve train. Um, you, know, these, you, know, you know as well as I do, you know, you don't need to go crazy on the valve train. A nice big valve will do the job. Yeah. So again, does what it needs. Nothing it doesn't. No, no need to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. Uh, now, in terms of the production process, you've obviously done the design of this. Yeah. Uh, with in terms of the uh, the the parts for yeah. the moulds for for uh, having them cast. Uh, are you actually doing the, the end machining of the, the cast heads and the block as well, or is that outsourced? Oh, we outsource some of that, and it's typically because of the size of the machine that you need. Um, we do have two CNC's in-house, so we do some of it. Um, but yeah, we do outsource. We have really good partnerships there. Um, now, another thing that we do with the with the patterns um, that I think is really interesting, we ran into difficulties with the way we wanted to do the water jackets in these heads, and we were having trouble with the tradition, uh, tradition patterns and, and making the moulds in, in sand, so we actually started 3D printing them in sand yeah. and um, and that's let us make the water jackets in the heads to what we would consider very optimal. Does, um, does that end up being a slower process 3D printing those uh, patterns? Well it's done in sand so it's you can think of it similar to when you see many 3D printed parts all around SEMA now on cars which I think is really cool it's a great innovation or a use of the technology to create to feed innovation but what we're now able to do is we can print into the sand and then we dust the sand that didn't get glue on it off and then we uh, then we store those and then we use those uh, at the foundry. Um, so yeah, look, it's one more step in the process, but I wouldn't say like it slows it down. I mean, these things take months for us to make anyway. So yeah, what's a couple of days of 3D printing? Yeah, no, that's understandable. Uh, now, in terms of the uh, bank angle with the, the V12, have you retained the factory LS bank angle there just for, again, compatibility with existing parts? Yeah, we've uh, uh, two or three reasons there. First, compatibility, that's a primary one. The second, a wide bank angle with a V12 is really good for getting a nice angle in for your intake runners. Um, a lot of people would say, well, why didn't you do 60? And these are my first reason. My second reason why didn't we go to 60 is that getting that good flow into the heads, which is, you know, is super important. It's not just what happens once it gets to the heads, a lot of a lot of the power is made before the heads in that intake. Um, and then uh, the third reason being um, keeping a nice low centre of gravity. So if you see that we, what we've done with Factory 5, that car they've got, a 60 degree V12 just wouldn't fit in that. It's really nice, they've kept that low centre of gravity, that car is going to be an absolute rocket and um, very, very trackable, keeping that, you know, same reason they've been so successful in Corvettes. You know, um, Chevrolet get a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of flack for sticking with a cam in block. Well, you know, there's a lot of benefits with a 90 degree cam in block. Um, and then the, the, the interesting thing about going 90 degree is you then go with odd fire. Now, odd fire in a V12 is very different than odd fire, say, in a Buick V6. Odd fire in a balanced engine doesn't really matter. If you think about this, um, say, odd fire, it's like if you've got a band and, and you've got someone in the band that's not playing real well and you turn them up, that's, that's like what happens when you've got an imbalanced engine. But when your engine's balanced, you can turn any member of the band up, it just sounds different. Now, let, let's go back because I, this is what kind of where I wanted to get to with it, this yeah. odd fire. But of course, a lot of people watching this aren't going to understand what that term means. So can you talk to us about how the bank angle of yep. the, the block influences the requirement to run, in this case, a V12 at 90 degrees yep. with odd fire? Yep. So if we've got um, common crank pins, so you've then got to figure out, you know, each bank of this runs like an inline six. Um, so its firing partners are on its own, on their own bank. So what that means is we have a 30-90 split. So you'll fire um, instead of um, instead of uh, instead of your traditional. Um, so so with the 30-90 split, you've got. So let, let me actually just go back there. Basically, what you're saying is, as we turn the crankshaft over, we're not getting one piston rise to top dead centre on its firing stroke at an even crank angle. Exactly so right. we've got 30 degrees between uh, two cylinders and then after that cylinder fires, you then have to go through 90 degrees and then 30, then 90. So this is the odd 
wildfire aspect. I just want to yeah. clear that up. Yeah, that's exactly right. So um, what, what I find really interesting about this is that you can, when you've got an, an even fire engine just like, that's why the straight six is so good. Um, something that's, that's really cool is the way they sound. So when we, um, we're testing these, sometimes if you can't hear, oh, what, what side's the problem on or where have I got a coil out or a plug out or whatever, you can actually unplug one bank and it sounds exactly like a straight six. And it's really, it's like it blows your mind. Like, hey, it's straight six. Then you plug it back in and, and off you go. So um, yeah, so it's exactly right. We, we're going, it fires and then it, it spins around another 90 degrees and fires again. But no downsides in that because of the, the balance? No, there's no imbalance because of that. Um, the only downsides that we have seen that we have to compensate with, this is all done in tuning. So if you think about it when you've got a common plenum, now all our engines don't have common plenums, but if you do have a common plenum, then you've got less recharge time for that bank that's got less time. Um, so the 90 degree takes, you know, it's got more air in, in the bank. So we tune So that then out. you've only got 30 degrees before the, the opposite cylinder fires. Exactly. So what happens then is we, um, we uh, you can trim that, of course. So you trim in that in a bank to bank trim. And, you know, modern ECUs can absolutely handle that. So it uh, solves that problem. All right. So in terms of these engines, Matt, Obviously, you've just mentioned you've got a couple of guys building some uh, high-power forced induction engines. Yep. Uh, you've engineered the whole thing, though. Give us your opinion. What's the sort of power limit? Where would you expect to be able to push one of these to? Uh, look, I'd say I'd like to see them around the 2,000 mark. Yeah, um, too much, much more than that, and, and we might have to start, you know, increasing the strength of crankshafts and things like that. Um, we've got, uh, hey, for the Barra people out there, there is a Barra part in this. We use Barra crank journals, so we use Barra-sized bearings in there. So, um, yeah, uh, I'd say about 2,000 horsepower is where we're going to look at these going in the next uh, next 12 months. Yeah, that's a pretty healthy number. Now. Obviously there's a lot of technology and development that's gone into this engine. Uh, they're not a cheap item, so this isn't something that your average punter is going to be looking to engine swap, but can you give us some broad sort of idea on what, what a setup like this will cost? Yeah, if you're an engine builder, and hopefully many people watching this are, uh, it's 22000 for an engine builder kit, which is the blockheads, crank and cam and valve covers, the things that you can't buy off the shelf. Then you go to your favourite you know, suppliers and, and favourite wholesale distributors and get all the parts you need. So it's actually, if you think about it, it's, it's about a $22,000 premium. That's because of the cost of making a bespoke casting and it just takes that time. So really, that's not that bad. Now, when we build these up and make them into full custom engines, they go right up to, you know, $55,000 full turnkey and that's a four wire hookup with an ECU that you've just got, you know, drop it in your car and go. Yeah. So, um, you know, our customers, at SEMA, they, they've got the means to get what they want and they want an engine to, uh, to show off and they also have typically given us great feedback on the tor torque curve on these. Well look, if you want to stand out from the Alias engine swap crowd, this is definitely one way to do it. If people do want to find out more, Matt, how can they reach out? Where can they go to? Yep, just v12ls.com. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Matt. Thank you. If you like that video, make sure you give it a thumbs up and if you're not already a subscriber, make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week. And if you like free stuff, we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson.